Here we go, Streetcars and Political Cartoons. Yeah. Um, I published a number of these in Twin City lines, but there's also some others that you haven't seen. And uh, the majority of these are by a guy named Bartholomew, who was the political cartoonist for the Minneapolis Journal for many years. And the reason we have them is that uh, he donated all of them to uh, the Hennepin County Library to the Minneapolis Special Collections. And so um, here you have, you know, kind of celebrating, hey, look at all the places you can go to from Minneapolis, uh, to Fort Snelling, to Lake Minnetonka. You can take Lake Street to downtown St. Paul, which by definition means it's post 1905. And, you know, doesn't everybody have a hat with a trolley pole on it? And that, that's a really cool uh, cartoon. I like that. Yeah, so. Uh, and then this is, says it's 1908, and this has got to be some kind of a spoof on the streetcar boats of Lake Minnetonka. The amphibious streetcar, an early lake car, arrives in port after a perilous voyage. Lake Minnetonka, all, all points on and off the lake. Uh, Wildhurst. Um, or maybe there was some big flooding or street flooding somewhere. Maybe that's possible, I suppose. As we note that the uh, conductor has handlebars. <laughs> good man, good man. <laughs> so these things that uh, jump around a little bit, this one up here, if you if you can read it, it says notice anti-pass law to, uh, to, to whom it may concern, policemen must pay a fare. The conductor's conundrum, how to get five cents out of this guy. Now, traditionally, Why? Traditionally, policemen in uniform and mail carriers in uniform, and actually firefighters in uniform, could always ride the cars for free. So this, I'm not sure, this is 1908, maybe there was an exception to that for a while. What, is, what does it mean when it says, how to get five cents change out of a copper? Is copper that like copper meaning, the penny? No, the copper is a cop, a policeman. Oh, it's a British. I'm thinking the metal. <laughs> it's a I British think. thing. They used to have copper buttons, so they call them coppers, and that's where the term cop comes from. Ah, okay. But the, British. The caption might have been a play on words, though, Ezra, because how do you get five cents out of one penny? Right, right. That's, oh, okay. that's where my mind was going. <laughs> Ten thousand that way, okay. I can't get past the fact that the conductor looks a lot like Bill Aarons. <laughs> <laughs> Very. Okay, um, let's see. There's a number of these about trying to catch a streetcar, but you missed it. And so uh, Weary Walker still runs for rest. Uh, and Henry Hurry chases the almighty dollar. Johnny Quarterback will soon be running for the Minnesota goal. And every day, City will go right on running for the streetcar, which they just missed. 1906. And, whoops, come back here. And this is kind of another take on that. This is the early bird and he gets up. Ah, he says, this morning I'm gonna to get to the office early. Plenty of time to set out these plants and hold the sweet peas and haul off this rugged rubbish. And wait, uh, only 15 minutes for breakfast and then he missed the streetcar. 1909. Now there's a bunch of them. The streetcar system from, oh, say 1900 up to about 1920 could not keep up with the ridership. They expanded as fast as they could. They built streetcars as fast as they could, but overcrowding was the name of the game. So this is 1911 and it's the first of a whole series of, you know, how do you fix this overcrowding problem? Aaron, what caused the boom in ridership in such a short period of time? Uh, the city expanded dramatically. Okay. Yeah. Cars didn't exist yet, really. No. Right. Automobiles yeah. didn't. But here's another one. On, the, uh, on sleds and skis behind the streetcar. This guy had a really good understanding of what streetcars looked like. Yeah. He even got the link coupler in that one. And... Well, he also, you notice, 
they did not have retrievers back right. then. Yep. Uh, he's got that right. How did they, what did they do instead of retrievers? Uh, they simply kind of took the loose rope and wrapped it around the uh, end of the gates. Yeah. Like number 78. Yeah. And this is the one from a different guy, a guy named Hedenstein. And it takes a little bit to look at it all, but this is how to accommodate it. Why not try Willie's wagon? And this one says, let's see, young lady, a boarded car, found unoccupied seat. Uh, oh boy, I can't read that too much for her. Ambulance called, physician may recover. Oh. Shot too much. Oh, I thought, oh, okay, yep. I get it. She fainted when she saw an unoccupied seat. Here we go. Here we got <laughs> passengers hanging from the standee thing that you could hold onto the trolley pole right on the roof. Looks like a picture of a train in India. Yeah. Right on the right on the front fender. And this just kind of shows people not being accommodated. Um, expression on a chap that has waited for two hours in the cold to get a chance to get on a car. This is cars passing people up because they're full. And move, move up the aisle, please. And of course, everybody had to get on the back. And so it was the conductors, they, they never could get people to go all the way to the front of the aisle because it was a dead end and they had to come out through the back as well. And that's what led eventually to them putting front exit doors on. What would be, Aaron, or anyone, what would be a good estimate, like take 1300, for example, running during 1911, and it was like jam-packed with people to the point where we could not pick up any more people. How many people do you think could cram into a streetcar uh, before it was considered, nope, no one else can get on? That's about 100. Yeah, I would, I would say 100 or maybe 110. Right. Um, you had a, if you um, had a, like, you know, 48 or so seated, you could just about double that. Mm -hmm. Okay. I've been in cars like that in New York and Washington and Tokyo where they're jam packed. Yep. Even today. So anyway, here's uh, here's another cartoon by somebody. This is uh, this one. How do you get them to move to the front? You jack up the rear of the car so they all slide down. Um, and let's see. This is just in general. Um, or here you have the car scoop, the patented padded scoop. And what does this one say? Young man, oh yeah. Uh, I remember uh, when right here in Minneapolis as late as the year 1900, the streetcars used to stop for 15 seconds at a time to let people on and off. Okay. The old timer telling the story. Yeah, the old timer. And then there's a couple of more about being a strap hanger, the power of the streetcar habit. No thanks, I'm, I prefer to stand, I'm used to it now. And then it got so crowded, this was when, you might remember I did an article on the strap hangers ordinance. And the strap hangers ordinance was the attempt by the city of Minneapolis to regulate how many people you could put on a streetcar so that you didn't have them all jam packed. And um, they actually put a limit of, I wanna say 80 people or so, 85 people on a streetcar. Uh, and after that you had to pass up and it just didn't work. Um, but the, this is a spoof on the strap hangers uh, ordinance. Did they make the conductor responsible for keeping track of the number of people? Well, first they made the whole crew responsible, even though the motorman was locked away in his uh, compartment, had nothing to do with it. And they actually ticketed them. Hmm. And then they, they, they changed it so it would be the conductor. And they actually arrested a couple of conductors, which then <laughs> caused much more because they took them off the car. And uh, at first the streetcar company said, well, you know, this is ridiculous and paid the fine so they changed the city ordinance that the streetcar company could not pay the fine for the crew member. And the biggest screw up was that there was a, a University Avenue car that came out of St. Paul with more than the number of standees on it that were legal. And uh, the police stopped the car, 
took the crew off, which tied up the entire line. But of course, in St. Paul, there was no standee ordinance. I mean, there was no ordinance <laughs> limiting it. So it's like you, when you get to the city limits, you're supposed to kick people off the car. So it, it was just a big, it, it went away after a while. It just didn't work. Here we go. Here's another one. The strap hangers lament. Uh, now our city dads deprive us of our dear old streetcar strap. After all these years of hanging, oh, weren't this a sad mishap? And so you have people strap hanging in various ways. And this one is about uh, route changes. And this guy, um, you know, how are they going to plan the route? And he's all confused. Um, the man who has worked out to his own satisfaction, the cross town line problem. And then, of course, they're slow. They were slow. So this one is, uh, here's Minnie and Paul, Minneapolis and Paul from St. Paul. And uh, this is the Selby Lake, which by the way, is, in, is still the slowest line to this day, which is why they're trying to put in bus rapid transit to speed it up. Because it currently, and, and this little weird thing, it's a Minnesota gopher and it says gopher insomnia. And this little figure says, of course, when we're really in a hurry, we'll walk. Um, and here's another one for the University Avenue line to go faster. And uh, this is also about uh, route changes. And can you tell me the way to get out of here to St. Paul? No, but I'd like to know how to get to Fort Snelling. And it says new Twin City streetcar routes. And that's 1910. The routes were because they kept adding track, um, the, uh, the routes would change and the combination of through routes would change. And so that's probably what this is in response to. And it changed pretty often just because they kept adding lines. Is the, the streetcar on the left, is that, is the character wearing, looks like a, a monk robe? He's got yeah, that, robe. that's, sure, that uh, is, St. Paul. St. Paul. Paul, yeah. Town full of too. Yeah. And here's a soldier trying to get to Fort Snelling. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you got a little halo on there. Oh, there, okay. Yeah, there's got a chumpy hat. Yeah. Okay, now the next couple of three, in the middle of the whole strap hanger thing, the Minneapolis City Council, all before this all stops had been far side, which is the streetcar would pull across the intersection with the gate by the intersection and everyone would get on. And they went to selectively having some stops in the downtown on Lake Street and sometimes on paved streets being a far, being near side, meaning stopping before the intersection. And the public got very confused as to whether the streetcar was gonna stop far side or near side. And so, uh, and they also, the city council changed it a couple of times, which is why you see this guy, this the great streetcar comedy. Back again, that's us, near side. Didn't they put signs up though saying? They, they did, style? they did, uh, or the streetcar company had signs, but nonetheless, people are creatures of habit. And when it suddenly changes, uh, this would happen. And this is a case of everybody's waiting near side, but they have just undone some of the uh, far side stops and placed them near side. And so you got all these people and they've gone to where they think it's going to and it goes over and stops far side, not near side. And this happened, people got passed up. And this is another one, looks like the very same guy. And I uh, hear, Car stop far side when it is a paved street, or maybe sometimes it's in the middle of the block. You can see there's all these things about uh, uh, <laughs> why does a man cross the street <laughs> to get to the far side stop? <laughs> Guy's got a timetable sticking out of his pocket. 
And then this is one more on near side and far side. See, streetcars stop on far side on slippery mornings on unpaved streets, on hot days on near side when not raining beyond Lake Street, on holidays and Sundays on both sides, except when snow is on the ground, middle of the block when in doubt. So. Uh, I wish we could get a, a reproduction of that sign that we could post. <laughs> Okay, then this one, uh, in 1923, they came out with the first lightweight, the first prototype lightweight, and they uh, promoted it as the silent streetcar. And so this is all kind of spoofs on that. Doggone, that car went right by my corner and I didn't hear it. Will you please step off the track? If I bump you, I know, I know you can't hear it. Uh, let's see, I'll have to ask the lady to leave at the next stop. If you're not quiet, your child, uh, if you can't quiet your child, you'll annoy the passengers. Um, here's kind of a politically incorrect one. Keep your eye on the deaf and dumb conductor when he calls your street. Um, and you, you can't win an argument with a silent conductor. And why not enlarge on the idea and have a rubber car? Well, the term dumb just meant couldn't speak. It wasn't an, never intended as an insult. It was a no, no term. I don't know if you still use, I, I don't know if dumb is still used though. No, it's not. It became an insult. Kind of like the terms <laughs> idiot and moron. Those were actually just intelligence levels. <laughs> you're, no, I'm serious. If your intelligence was between X and X, you're an idiot. Just like genius is a, is a term if you're over a certain level. They got turned into insults though. So therefore, but they never were direct, created as insults. This is actually from an advertisement for Twin City Lines. You know, when the cars run together, would you please get on the second car? Because the first one is all jammed up, which is why he's late to begin with. Now, this was a result. They opened the cable car line on Selby Hill and, and almost immediately... Uh, or, or in a short time, they had a horrific accident that killed a couple of people and injured a guy lost a leg. And so this is the not very funny depiction of that. Body parts laying all over it. And there's a couple here, I don't really know what they mean, but Thomas Lowry is in them. And they did hold the Republican National Convention and Lowry's running after the car and it says, Tom wants to take the car to the Republican National Convention. Will they open the gates for him? And there's probably something going on that we don't know about. And here's another one with Lowry. And it says, raise in wages of streetcar employees. Tom Lowry plays Santa Claus. Uh, come to think of it, this cold weather reminds me of Christmas. So. I'm not sure what was going on there. It looks like he's handing out raises. Yeah, they must have given and people a raise. And the trainmen in the background in bed there are happy about it. So yeah. the date on the on the uh, cartoon is May fourth, nineteen oh seven. Yeah, yeah. And I found this one somewhere. I don't really know what's going on with it. Here, Horace Lowry is in charge, which means it's uh, after Tom Lowry died in 1908. Um, you have the International Workers of the World, the Wobblies, saying, um, you know, come into the car, and the labor is saying, no, we won't. Well, the Wobblies were usually the most radical uh, unionists, and somebody's getting paid off. And you can see it's headed for the Capitol. Not quite sure what all this was about. We can yeah. see in inside the car where it says two dollar or two hundred fifty dollars nickels and dimes. You can see it says nineteen nineteen right below okay. that. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. And then uh, there are two of them here, uh, and I, I kind of vaguely have an idea what this is about. <laughs> it says um, that this guy represents uh, the railroads, and this is a state official. And this is railroad regulation. And I, the implication is that they were going to go, try to regulate the streetcar company as if it was a railroad. 
and that that's what's causing problems here. And the way I think I know is that then there's this one and it says, uh, what's old streetcar so set up about? He says, haven't you heard the court ruled he's no common carrier, meaning he's not a railroad. And so I don't know. Now this of course is the suburban um, subsidiary of Twin City Lines that ran the railroads outside of the city. I mean, they ran the streetcars outside of the city and they ran them like railroads out there. So once again, I don't know, there, perhaps he wanted to be regulated as a railroad when he was in the suburbs, I don't know. And uh, then there's some stuff on uh, fares and payment. And here's Twin City Rapid Transit and six rides for a quarter ordinance. And I think uh, this was, this was where um, the nickel fare had been around since 1872. Now it's about 1919 or so. And because of World War I, the uh, inflation has finally taken off and the nickel value has plummeted. And Twin City Lines is trying to get a fare increase without much success. And so, you know, good service at cost or to the junk pile. And here's, here's another one. The prices have gone up for everything, um, but the streetcar company is not getting any more money. So the streetcar is getting drowned in the inflation. And this one right here really kind of shows it. 1916 nickel. Um, and it shows the little nickel pushing the streetcar along at high speed on level ground. Now here's the 1918 nickel, which is uh, inflation is taking its toll and the poor nickel is having trouble. And here's the 1919 nickel saying, ain't I gonna get any help? Meaning, uh, can I get a fare increase? And the answer was they did eventually. This is what led to shifting the regulation for fares from the city to the state because they couldn't get it out of the city. So eventually they went to the state and they got help. Uh, here's another one kind of on the same, the street railway company. Maybe we ought to feed him. Oh, he had a meal in 1916. And then here's the last one. And um, this shows, you know, how horrible it was not having streetcar service and the guy's walking through the rain. Well, now he has streetcar service. Made it stop raining through. Right. And presumably this is sunshiny. It's the same guy who's been doing these, you know, the streetcar company's in trouble if they don't get the fare increase. And maybe they got the fare increase. So looks like the roads got paid too. 